This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast, episode, what is it, Brad? 104. Ep- 104. Thank you. <laughs> episode 104. Uh, last episode, we were talking about the sun. Mm-hmm. Are we continuing in that vein, Randall? Yeah, well, I want to continue on the idea of the natural forces that have been affecting civilizations on the planet, including the sun. Uh there's a lot to get into with the sun and unpack. And we just kind of barely touched the, scratch the surface of the, the new information and new knowledge that's coming out about the sun. We can certainly get into that. I had a few more things that have kind of been sitting on the back burner, a couple of new things uh, that I thought would be interesting to look at. I've been kind of diving into some of the periods of upheaval in the history of civilization on planet Earth and recently uh, I've been looking at the neoglaciation or the neoglacial, the neoglacial, which is usually dated around 6,000 years ago, plus or minus a few centuries, right? Now, that is what followed immediately after the so-called climatic optimum, which was kind of uh, the period that lasted from about 10,000 to roughly 6,000 years ago with, of course, variability within it and a major interruption at about 8,300 years ago. Remember the cold spike, that 8,300-year cold spike? We talked about it. We've seen the Green Greenland ice core graphs, and it shows up pretty prominently. It's probably the most prominent spike within the Holocene record, and it dates about 8,300 years ago, and it was in the middle of the climatic optimum. Now, the climatic optimum, you know, was the period post-glacial, immediately post-glacial, that actually was warmer than now. Um, And it kind of was in two phases, sort of like the Ice Age, the Little Ice Age, which kind of was in two phases. You know, it started around very, with some variability, it started in the late 1200s and early 1300s, depending where you were on the planet. It didn't start simultaneously everywhere. Important point. Um, And then it ameliorated somewhat, and then it came back again uh, with full ferocity and carried us up into the 1800s. And then it began to to ameliorate. And that's when we begin to see uh, the glaciers starting to recede and so on. And, you know, there's a new study. Let me see if I have it. So there was a cold spike at 6,000 BC, 6,300 BC. That's what you're saying? No, the the cold spike. Well, okay. So in the middle of the, the climatic optimum, a little bit more towards the 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 earlier half of it, uh, there was this cold spike that lasted at least a few years, maybe a few decades. I haven't looked at the latest data on that, but it's a now it's a fairly well known. If you look at the you look at the ice core graphs and some of the other climate records, it, it shows up very prominent. It like I said, it's probably one of the most prominent cold spikes in the entire Holocene. But then uh, around 6,000 years ago, the second phase of the climatic optimum gave way to the neoglaciation, as it's called, the neoglacial. And that, so that was a very significant significant climate shift within the Holocene. And usually it's dated around 6,000 years ago. And it was marked by global cooling and an expansion of glaciers and ice sheets worldwide. Okay, and then there was some variable variability in there. There was the Minoan warm period. Then that was followed by cold. Then there was the Roman warm period. And then that was followed by the cold of the Dark Ages. Then that gave way to the medieval warm period. And then, like we were, I was just saying, in the late 1200s, early 1300s, the medieval warm period gave way to the first phase of the Little Ice Age. And then that ameliorated somewhat around between the time of the renaissance and then it got cold again and then began to ameliorate or lessen the intensity of the cold around again not simultaneous everywhere 
uh, because there's, there's a lot of regional factors that play into this, but generally you could say around 1850, it's pretty clear that the planet is starting to warm because we can see that most glacier recession began in the mid 19th century. It didn't begin in the mid 20th century when we started, when humans started uh, pumping, you know, huge volumes of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. In fact, what we see, and I can probably pull up a, a, a graph here, there's been several graphs done showing the glacier recession that occurred. Um, uh oh, did we have an intruder? An interloper. Okay, so there was a um, an amelioration uh, of the of the uh, little ice age that began in the nineteenth century, and we're essentially been in it. But even now, if we look at it, we see there was variability within there within that. So it began to warm, and then it warmed up, and in the nineteen thirties, that global warmth peaked. In fact, in the United States, I think the two warmest years were 1935, 1936. So the 30s were w at warmer than now. Um, then uh, bet between the 1940s and the 1970s, the climate cooled. And that was one of the things that gave rise to the fear that we were going to be, you know, the global cooling was going to be the thing that did us in, that we might be headed back into the, to an ice age. And that was actually based upon empirical evidence and proxy evidence, uh, not proxy evidence, empirical data of real time that showed that the climate was cooling slightly between the 1940s and the 1970s. Then in the 1980s, it began to warm again. And then around between 10 and 15 years ago, it pretty much stabilized and the planet hasn't gotten really any warmer in the last 10 years. I mean, the, the 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 warming now, the temperatures are about the same as they were 10 years ago, pretty much flat. The pause, oftentimes it's referred to, and the pause is real. Um, so there is a lot of variability. Now, oh, I'll mention this too. When, when that global cooling period between the 1940s and the 1970s occurred, the other thing that happened simultaneous with that was the radiocarbon dating that was showing the onset, the last glacial onset was way quicker than anybody had imagined. And that the periods of interglacial warmth, such as now, were uh, were um, much shorter than previously believed. So at that point, it became uh, apparent that the, the current uh, warming period has outlasted any of the previously measured warming periods or comparable. So those two things sort of fueled the initial fear that they're, you know, are we sliding into another ice age? If we keep, if this trend keeps going for decades, how long will it be before we're back into the little ice age? You know, I mean, if that trend had kept going between the forties and the seventies, yeah, we'd be in a little ice age right now. So then that raises an interesting question. What what climatic factors caused the warming that began pretty much in the 1980s? So there was a pretty much a major spike of warming, 80s, 90s, and into the early 2000s. The point is that the climate has not been stable. It's been variable. And you can see that there's variability, more, more uh, you know, uh, time-limited variability within greater cycles of change. So the signal, let's say, of the Little Ice Age, that's left a pretty good imprint because one of the things that happened during the Little Ice Age is that the glaciers that had grown to their largest extent in the entire Holocene built moraines and, 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 and as a result of that, and made, you know, glacial deposits, you know, datable glacial deposits, it showed you, one could see that, yeah, these are the biggest the glaciers have gotten. Because any previous expansions of the glaciers, say, like even at the onset of the neoglaciation 6,000 years ago, they were overridden by the Little Ice Age glaciers. So in other words, earlier glaciers had expanded, but the Little Ice Age glaciers expanded more. 
So when they did that, they pretty much obliterated the previous moorings, terminal moorings and so on. Does that make sense? And so we could see that yep. the Little Ice Age glaciers had grown to the biggest extent that they've been throughout the entire Holocene. So interestingly, if you look at the baselines, uh, you know, in the global warming scenarios, in the climate crisis scenarios, glacier re re recession is considered one of the main canaries in the coal mine of the of the impending global warming crisis that we're supposedly heading into. But in reality, if you look at it, I mean, it's no worse than anything that's happened before, uh, previous to this. I'll, I got this. This just came out. This is an interesting. Uh, this just came out three days ago. Um, and let's see, what was the source of this? Uh, yeah, here's the report. Archaeologists surveyed melting ice patches in Canada and uncovered dozens of ancient artifacts spanning 7,000 years. Uh, then there's photos that show the unique and perishable finds. After two winters with low snowpack, researchers set out to survey several melting ice patches in Mount Ed Edziza Provincial Park. Where do you know? You guys know where that is by any chance? Is this the place where the uh, the hikers started going up there? They started finding because uh, like the no ice the the first time we, first one we talked about that was in a in an Alpen pass between yeah the, in the Italian Alps and the Swiss Alps. Uh, okay. And then there was a subsequent report from the Norwegian mountains where the glacier his glaciers had receded and showed the same thing. I don't have that at That's either so one of cool, those man. reports at my fingertips. But this is a third. This is awesome. um, maybe Kyle, look up this E D Z I Z A Provincial Park. That's um. So okay, so this study was published in the Journal of Field Archaeology. Uh, it's in Canada, Mount Edziza, 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 probably provincial park. What, what, what province? Northwestern is British Columbia. Oh, okay, northwestern British Columbia. So it says it's a volcanic landscape that is extremely significant to the Tahltan, Tahltan, one of Canada's indigenous First Nations. Uh, the Tahltan have used the mountains for seasonal hunts for centuries and continue to do so today. Previous scientists had located many vast obsidian quarries and obsidian awesome. artifacts in the park, but the nearby ice patches had not been studied as extensively. Reach researchers said they were intrigued by the possibility of finding perishable ancient artifacts preserved in the ice. Uh, so when the ice receded, the researchers visited nine patches and, of course, immediately found 56 perishable artifacts um, that were mostly things uh, manufactured from wood, uh, birch bark, projectile shafts, walking staffs, uh, animal remains used for stitched hide boots, carved antler and bone tools. So anyways, here's the point. These artifacts, like the ones in Norway and the ones in the Italian Alps, were buried under the ice. With the recession of the ice, now it's apparent that people were occupying that for 7,000 years when there was no ice there. So, yeah, here's the title. Melting ice reveals dozens of 7,000-year-old artifacts in Canada. Not not that they lived there for 7,000, but it says here, artifacts spanning 7,000 years. I I went, I got the, I went to the, uh, the website, I found the journal, found the article from the Journal of Field Archaeology. So I have that, but I, that was just yesterday. So I haven't had a chance to actually read the original article. This is just the report that appeared three days ago. Um, but that's interesting. But but see what that does is it supports the idea that that the recession of the glaciers that we've seen in the last century is nothing unprecedented. In fact, what it is is that the expansion 
of the Little Ice Age glaciers in con the context of the Holocene, that was unprecedented. Anyways, then within that, we have, you know, the history of civilization is entirely contained and encompassed within, at present anyway, within the Holocene. And we're pushing back. Oh, let's see. And what's the one of the more recent things? I don't, maybe I'll pull it up here in a minute. The, uh, the study showing, let's see, where were they now? The study showing that uh, now that it proved definitively, oh, yes, the footprints in New Mexico. Have you seen that? Yes. Proving definitively yes. that people were walking there 22,000 years ago. Yes, right. that's awesome. Uh-huh. Yeah, they now have multiple uh, different dating techniques showing mm -hmm. that the, the original idea, the original dates, which they got that people were worried there was contamination because they were too early. Yeah, and the, now they have the old carbon lines. effect. I think yeah, one of the, they've got. The, yeah, now they've got multiple lines of evidence pointing to this, pointing to that date. And and now I just the report came out. I haven't really digested it yet. I just scanned it. The tracks were mostly women and children, right? Well, Is there's one. one I, I don't know about that, but there's definitely one famous set of a track of a woman and a child. Yeah, we talked about that on the but, show. Yeah, and how I haven't, I haven't they heard apparently that. went to an encampment or something. They turned around and went back, and in that interim, there was like some mammoths and things that crossed their track, and some other yes. mega mammals. And yeah, so that the, was a really interesting story. The yeah. outgoing track was a was a female carrying a child, and then right. occasionally she would stop, and you'd see the child's footprints running around her. Uh huh. Then it would just be her footprints going out, and it was a mile a little over a mile or something in a very straight line that de that deviated no more than one meter from straight. Wow. And then, uh, sometime later she came back, but she didn't have the child. Her footprints were not as heavy, not as heavily indentated in her. And there wasn't as much twisting in the footprints, which uh -huh. suggests she wasn't going as fast. So on her way out with the child, she was like, go, very fastly walking, like as fast as you can walk. Uh huh. And then her return journey was like a normal pace. But while she was gone, a uh, a sloth uh, approached her footprints and a great sloth and s stood up on its hind legs and looked around, then went back down and kept going. And then a mammoth walked by and did not care at all. <laughs> and then she came that was back mammoth, they over time. <laughs> Yeah, her footprints return over top of their tracks. So, like, they passed uh -huh. in the rough hour or whatever while she was gone. It's wild. I love it. It is story. wild when you start actually imagining that whole scenario and yeah. realizing this is something that happened. This was a. Yeah, and then those Probably. footprints, something happened that preserved those footprints forever. They were never trampled on by any other animals uh -huh. or people. So it's like she was the last one to step in those places before they were covered forever until now. That is crazy to me. So what? how and did it, that it happen? And it dried out, right? It didn't stay wet or else the prints would have been slowly destroyed. Yeah. So. so then you got to wonder, you know, okay, well, what was – it's almost like she was on a mission. She had this child. She was in a big hurry. She delivered yeah. the child to somebody and then came back. Yeah. And then right after that, something happened now uh, that preserved the tracks. Yeah. So what was that? Yeah. Exactly. What and does it have? Does it have anything to do with the fact that she was in a hurry? Yeah. That's right? yeah. yeah. That's what I wonder too. And then <laughs> and this is a thing. This crazy thing to me is that the stories said she was walking on the bank of the lake. Yeah. So if it was the bank of a lake, that kind of tells you how she was able to walk this perfectly straight line. But but how were the mammoths and sloths crossing her track? They would have to be walking into yeah. the lake. Well, okay, so is it possible then, I mean, that the lake was a watering hole and they're Very there shallow. Shallow, they're there drinking water while she's walking by. Then she gets by and then they're done drinking you know, hydrating and they, and they get up and they, they go back across. That could be it. Yeah. Well, because how close was her track? Their, foot, 
to the to the shoreline of this lake. We don't know. It doesn't. I tried to find this out, but that's the weird thing about it is that the animals don't have a return path. So if she was on the bank of a lake, the animals had to walk into the lake and not return or out of the lake. Oh, wait a minute. So so the animals crossed going towards the lake, not away from the lake. I don't know. We it don't doesn't know. It say. just says they crossed her track. They crossed her track. But if she's walking on the bank, there's only they either have to come out of the water or go into it and not return. Yeah. So maybe it's a really shallow lake and they just could walk all the way across. I don't know. It's okay, well, that would make me think that they were in the water getting a drink and then they left and didn't come back. So, yeah. But wait a minute. Why would you not see their tracks? On the way in. On the way in. Yes. Yeah. And there's, I mean, the, the the stuff that I've read on this says that there's tens of thousands of yeah. print. I've heard this too, yeah. Uh, and a lot of them are almost invisible because they're still beneath the surface layer. And the researchers were saying, like, when you go out in the morning at the, when it's exactly the right time and the air temperature is correct and there's a little bit of dew on the ground, then you see all the prints because what you're seeing is like a ghost. Of the prints that are actually below the surface. Uh huh. Uh, and they've done some digging, like, you know, where they kind of very carefully go in and sort of pull the material of the surface off of the layer that has the prints uh, and expose them. But they don't, I, I think they're not trying, they're trying not to expose too many of them because, you know, they degrade pretty quickly once they're. I'm sure. The other thing that's not stone, you know, it's sounds like there must be a Brothers of the Serpent episode already about this. <laughs> we have yes. covered this multiple times. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing that's interesting, too, is that what, there's there's a, a famous one of like kids playing in a, a big footprint. Like little children's footprints. Like they're playing in the puddle. Like of a, a puddle print. inside a big print. <laughs> <laughs> so it's I don't know. It's just trying to. I just love it. I, I there's 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 something incredibly mysterious about it, and the and it's like that one set just well, yeah, doesn't make, a, make, make sense. a story out of these few clues that you get. Yeah. yeah, and then it's like, who were these people, and where did they go? You know, they vanished. They forever. disappeared. I mean, that's this is a screen share of the yeah twenty two thousand year old footprints in New Mexico. Fossilized human footprints shown at the White Sands National Park in New Mexico. According to a, repub a report published in the journal Science, the impressions indicate that early humans were walking across North America around 23,000 years ago. We have to go there, boys. Yeah, we, yeah, we need to go this. see this stuff. We need to go there and leave our footprints. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some humans were walking across New Mexico. We had these early humans, and then 23,000 years later, <laughs> some other humans came and walked. So, uh, okay, there. Uh, this white, this white human was clearly wearing Merrill boots. <laughs> Pretty sure those are Birkenstocks. Uh, <laughs> no, they're, they're, they're obviously, they're barefoot. Yeah, I know. We're, we're talking about I if was, we left prints. If you left footprints, they would be Merrill boots. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but anyways, what we got onto this, we got on a little bit of a sidetrack there, but that, yeah. How does this tie into w where you were going, the, the White Sands footprints? Well, just, you know, the, uh, well, okay. Um, I'm not sure. Oh, well, because of the ago. fact... The White Sands footprints just was just in the news, and oh yeah, only because you know they had it had been proposed, like you said, a couple of years ago it had been proposed, uh, but then there were the skeptics who didn't think that the the dating was correct, and now, I mean, what that's doing is pushing the accepted date by mainstream academia back by what seven thousand years or so. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. What's what's the climate situation in the? In North America, twenty-two to twenty-three thousand years ago. Well, I mean, we're getting into the New Mexico wouldn't have been glaciated, but no, you know the the late Wisconsin phase of glacial expansion began around twenty-five to twenty-six, maybe maybe twenty-seven thousand years ago. So the glaciers 
you know, North would be still growing um, for another couple of thousand years at least. So that's it's like that's what I thought. Is it like right around the late glacial maximum? Is that yeah? Sort it's, of, it's, it's yeah. pretty much heading into the late glacial maximum. Yes. Wow. And of course, there would have been lots of megafauna in North America then. That's the other really cool thing about this is that it it utterly destroys the overkill hypothesis. Those yeah. people had been living with the megafauna. Yeah. Like you said, for thousands of years before the megafauna went extinct. Right. And the and the argument for the overkill yeah, hypothesis one of the arguments. is that like they show up and it's like these animals never saw humans before and didn't know that they needed to fear them. <laughs> yeah. So they were just easy to to slaughter. Yeah. yeah the they million. just stood there like, you know, totally dumb animals and <laughs> duh. Well, I mean, I think yeah, and the other way that they put it is that that you know it's it's the arrival of humans that that begins the total decline of all the megafauna yeah, right? right and so like whatever the reasons are they're trying to say that these animals had survived here for millions of years and were fine and then humans show up and they all disappear and that's part of the overkill but i mean those same animals were also in the old world side by side with humans for hundreds of yeah, thousands yeah. of years and they yep. weren't being slaughtered so I, I don't think it's a good argument but it is one of the ones that they try to make for the overkill hypothesis in the in the in North America, right? And yeah, it doesn't seem to work now because now we have human occupation going back to twenty two, twenty three thousand years at the at the least. Yeah. So, and that seems to be the, you know, that's that date is the end of the of the time of these people that left these prints living in that area because they are gone after that. So. Yeah. So then this is from the, uh, yeah, this is directly from the Journal of Field Archaeology here. It says, uh, the article presents the results of archaeological survey of ice patches in the vicinity of the vast obsidian quarries and artifacts uh, scatters found near Goat Mountain and the Kitsu Plateau in Mount Ziza Provincial Park. Let's see, ice patch research in North America has been the most intensive in the Yukon, with survey and monitoring conducted since 1997. Uh, most of the objects found there are associated with the ancient practice of hunting caribou on the ice patches. Uh, as of 2012, at least 207 perishable artifacts from 43 ice patches had been recorded with associated radiocarbon ages spanning the last 9,000 years. Um, wow. So this work has been going on. Uh, so this, is, this of course, is all Holocene. Are you going last 9,000 years, I would put us you know, into the early Holocene, and that would have been very much into the climatic optimum. So the climatic optimum, glacier, glaciers were much smaller, than they had been during the late ice age, even in fact smaller than they are now. In, in some, that would is what it, we'll put it this way. Even conservatively, they were as receded to the uh, an extent similar to what they are right now. And in fact, when you have an ice sheet, an a glacier receding, and then you see that there are these artifacts under there that were left there when when there was a preceding era, when there was no ice there, well, then you got to go, okay, well, how much further up, you know? And then, of course, the tree line during the warmer periods went went up during the climatic optimum and has gone back down again during the Little Ice Age. So that's the other thing is that you, when the glaciers are receding, now they're finding remnants of former forests that were growing there during the Holocene, when there was no ice, then the ice came in, destroyed the forest, covered the forest. And so now when it's receding, it's exposing the former existence of a forest. So what is this telling us? I mean, to me, the, the message here is pretty unmistakable. And that is that, yeah, we're looking at times as warm or even warmer than, than present. Um, so, like, here's here's another I'm going to take from this. This is very consistent with studies on the Holocene. This is from nine years ago, but it's, um, you know, it's uh, two geologists have been studying radiocarbon dates from peat 
uh, from the top and base of a bog exposed by recent retreat of the Rutor Glacier. Uh, let's see, where is the Rutor Glacier? Um, I'm sure it'll come up at any some point here, but this is similar. This is similar kind of evidence here. Um, the retreat, retreat of the Rutor, it's spelled R-U-T-O-R, glacier, showed that the glacier front terminated up valley from the bog from 8,400 until at least 6,000 years before present. The evidence is consistent with botanical data that point to a high tree line during the interval and to reconstructed mean July temperatures, get this now, at least four degrees centigrade warmer than present temperatures. Then Italy. Italy. Okay, so this is, yeah, so this is in that, I wonder where in Italy. Is it up near the... Does, uh, uh, it's one of the biggest in the Aosta or Aosta Valley, and the sixth biggest glacier in Italy. It is located in the valley of La Tuile, or Tuile, I don't know how to say it. T Testa del Rutor is the name of the mountain, in the, the highest mountain in the region. Okay, that's probably in the same region as the earlier study that I was referring to which I might be able to pull up on the break. But anyways, did you get that? The evidence is consistent with botanical data that point to a high tree line higher than now during the interval and to recon reconstructed mean July temperatures at least four degrees centigrade warmer than the present temperatures. Wow. Hmm. If the mass Impossible. balance history of the glacier is typical of other glaciers in this region, it is likely that average equilibrium line altitudes during the interval of contraction remained above those of the present and well above those of subsequent neoglacial ice advances. So in other words, they're saying that the, that the tree line was well above the current tree line between 6,000 and 8,400 years ago. And temperatures in this particular region were up to four degrees warmer in the summer than at present. However, that's the funny. Current, the current warmth is unprecedented, according. Yes, to I, that's what I was going to say. I'm sorry that for interrupting you, but I was when I was trying to look up neoglaciation earlier to see if I could find uh, some timelines for it. And by the way, they're they're basically saying it's it the timelines shift depending on where. Uh, where in the world you're looking at it? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. But Wikipedia says neoglaciation has followed the hypsothermal or Holocene climatic optimum, which was the warmest point in the Earth's climate during the current interglacial stage, excluding the global warming-induced temperature increase starting in the 20th century. Of course, they're going to say that because yeah. Wikipedia is completely politically compromised. Yeah. Uh huh. But it, but you what you were just reading is like evidence for four degrees centigrade warmer than now. Yeah. And that's based upon, you know, the plants that were growing there, the level, the tree line. Yeah. I'm sure that if I went in here, we would see that uh, it would give us a, uh, how much d the differential in the tree line here. Uh, yeah. And then he quotes here uh, in the discussion, mountain glaciers are commonly believed to have been less extensive immediately prior to neoglacial ice advances of the past five millennia than now. And then he quotes Porter and Denton from 1967, Denton and Parler from 1973, Mayuski and others from 1981, and others. Um, so, yeah, so the, again, here, you know, the, the point I think is, is that, um, you know, there is a manufactured narrative that is cherry picking the evidence and you know, most people who hear about, oh, it's the warmest it's been, you know, like the claim was just made last summer that this is, I mean, literally, it was said over mainstream media, this is the warmest it's been in 100,000 years. Right. I mean, that's ridiculous. It's laughable. But, you know, the, when you have people that have are products of the government education monopoly, they hear that and then they believe it. And, oh, we got to do something. We've got to shut down civilization. Well, here's the thing. I mean, 
if we go along oblivious, sooner or later, nature will do what it's done before. Nature has shut down civilization many times. Yeah. No, we have to shut down civilization to keep nature from shutting down civilization. <laughs> well, yeah. It, that's, that's the goal, right? If we don't shut it down, then nature will shut it down. So we got to shut it down to keep it from being shut down. <laughs> yeah, let's... Uh, Hands ego back again. Stronger than nature. <laughs> yeah, the field evidence and radiocarbon dates from Rutor Glacier indicate that one or more bodies of peat, which now lie in the deglaciated foreland and possibly still beneath the glacier, formed and remained beyond the terminus from at least 8,400 until about 6,000 years before present. Such conditions require that the glacier's equilibrium line stood as high as or higher than it does today for an extended time. That this is not a unique case is demonstrated by fossil remains of larynx and pinus trees, which recently have been released at the fronts of Gorner, Zemut, Ver Verpaclay and Mont Mine or Menet glaciers in the Swiss Alps. So there he's, he's referencing one, two, three, four glaciers that have been receding in the Swiss Alps, showing the same thing. They're revealing former trees. So in other words, the trees were growing, the weather got cold, the glacier advanced, encroached over areas that had previously been forested, killed the trees, and then now they're melting back to really to where they were previously. So again, we're being told over and over, oh, this all this stuff that's happening is unprecedented. And then so I, let's see, they dated. I'm also I'm also interested in this, like, what is the stat what is the state of these tree remains? You know, like we we've talked about this many times, like the advance of the ice is just just crushing everything in front of it into dust. But if it's retreating and leaving evidence of trees then i mean are, are they talking about tiny wood fragments or are they well, finding root here. systems but it said seven such trees from those four glacier four four lands is the area in front of the glacier snout okay, okay. so we can add that to our vocab the four lands, four lands. The glacier four lands okay yeah that's different that than four down into the warm areas yeah, yeah. Okay. okay seven such trees Samples of which range in age from about 8,200 to 6,000 years before present, uh, must have lived in stable environments behind or above the present limits of the glaciers. Although the trees are inferred to have been killed and overrun by advancing ice at the times indicated by the radiocarbon dates of the outer wood. Such advances were restricted to the zone inside AD 1973 limit of the ice. Um, as the data provide only maximum possible limits for the glacier expansion, the true magnitude of the advances is unknown. However, they were small enough that the ice front advanced no further than its limit during the recent interval of mid 20th century glacier contraction. Um, the well, evidence it doesn't, supports, it doesn't really, it doesn't really describe the state of the, the tree samples they're finding so far. No. Yeah. The evidence supports the hypothesis that mountain glaciers were in a contracted state for several millennia during the middle Holocene hypsothermal interval. Uh, it is also consistent with results of recent paleoclimatic reconstructions of Europe that on the basis of pollen data indicate that mean July temperature in the Western Alps was at least four degrees centigrade warmer about 6,000 years before present than it is today. So, uh, interesting stuff. Well, on that question about the state of the trees, uh, I think in what, one of the mountain passes, the first one that I heard of, where people were able to finally go up there, they found like a quiver of arrows. Yeah. So 
the glacier, if the glacier didn't destroy a quiver of arrows, it probably didn't destroy those trees. Very well. yeah. yeah, I'm thinking, you know, there are, there are places, you know, where you have, for example, your your accumulation zone where there's not going to be a lot of glacier flow. I mean, it'll flow out from there, but picture the snow starts coming and you're going to have multiple years of snow burying whatever is there. Now you go down slope from there and the gray, and again, the, the, the steeper the gradient, the faster the glaciers are going to be moving. So and I presume it's, it's, it's slump, it's slumping off of the, of yeah. the accumulation zone. Yes. Yeah. So the, what's underneath is very well affected. Yeah. Um, and I would think too, if those, you know, if it was doing a lot of ripping up and grinding of these trees, then they would be much further down the mountain than they would have started at. So they if must they're be, ripping up the trees. Yeah. No, I think they're finding, like I've actually they're seen. They're in C2. Yeah. I think that there's actually in some cases like stumps. Yeah. Still there. They've been sheared off, but the stumps and the roots they're, don't. They're, they're finding there. roots. Yeah. That's cool. So there he was referencing the the Alps and then the Rutoy. Uh this is uh yeah, in British Columbia. So we have basically two sides of the world showing the same evidence of a of a climate that's about four degrees war centigrade warmer than now. So that's a pretty good indication that we're looking at something that's a, a warming that's global in extent. Um, well, so, you yeah. want to you want to take a quick break? Sure. Um, we can all think about that. Four degrees centigrade warmer than now. Eight thousand mm -hmm. between six. The 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 date here on this study was six thousand to eighty four hundred years ago. Ago. Okay. So now. I, I, I mentioned the cold snap at 8,300, but I've noticed there's up to a century or two variability in the dating of that cold yeah. spike. And then with the neoglaciation, the onset of that, I said around 6,000. But again, there are multiple uh, centennial variability, like you said there in reading from Wikipedia, which I would agree with. It was not uniform everywhere. Yeah. Some there was places. a general overall uh, climate shift, but it was it it affected different regions at different times. Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. Let's take a break, and we'll be we'll be right back. Okay. We're back, ladies and gentlemen. Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast returns. Uh, continuing on, we got more stuff on this period you've been talking well, about. Yeah, well, you know, I'm very, you know, in fact, after meeting you guys four years ago, you know, I was already shifting over to like taking a deeper look at the Holocene. And I've continued to do that because now we begin to see, you know, I was primarily looking at these really outsized geological events. So, I mean, you know, at a time there was looking at the great mass extinction episodes that, you know, KT, the Permian Triassic, the late Ordovician, the, the, the late Devonian, all of those, then coming into, you know, the latest catastrophic episode at the end of the last ice age. And how that might have affected the long term uh you know evolution of human culture that goes back to the beginning of humans, which of course is still a uh a, a, a question in an area of, of of you know strong interest. But I've also been now thinking more about what has gone on in the Holocene, more so than I was uh, you know, a couple of de a decade or two ago. And uh what I'm finding, you know, is that there's just this, this amazing uh, material coming coming out now that, you know, so we're just, what we've been just talking about is, is Holocene events. 
You know, we have the climatic optimum. The the idea that you might have had periods that were do, multiple degrees warmer than now. What are the implications of that? And yeah, should we be looking at that uh, in the context of well, you know, the concern now is we're you know what is it one point two degrees warmer now than the end the start of the industrial revolution, right? So we're still well within the range of natural variability, at least according to a whole bunch of studies that suggest there have been much warmer periods during the Holocene. But the Holocene is, if we're, you know, up to this point, if we're talking about civilization, we've got hard evidence now of civilizations that have risen and fallen or come and disappeared that reigned for hundreds, if not thousands of years, and then they've gone. Now, this is all pretty much within the Holocene. Right. I mean, we could almost say that the history of civilization as we currently understand it is pretty much a Holocene phenomenon. And anything back when we get into the Pleistocene, of course, is more speculative and not even considered a plausible scenario by mainstream academia, mainstream archaeologists. So leaving aside the question of civilization that may have existed in the Pleistocene, pre-Younger Dryas, back into the late glacial maximum and beyond, is a whole separate question. Then there's the question of this, this amazingly rich and complex story of uh, efforts to create civilization as we know it during the Holocene. And even in the Holocene, we discover that it's been enormously variable and there's a lot of evidence suggesting that, you know, there have been multiple efforts to establish civilization, and they've been interrupted by things that have happened. Uh, there's one here. Let me let me pull this up. This is a uh, report that appeared in the Journal of Archaeological Science. Uh, this was in 2011. And it is the ninth century before the Common Era destruction layer at Tel S. Safi Gath. Safi S A F I, and then it has a back a forward slash G A T H. But this was in Israel. Okay, a ninth century before Common Era destruction layer. Okay, integrating macro and micro archaeology. And then this is what they say in their abstract. Destruction events in multi-period sites are valuable marker horizons that represent time-synchronous events across the site and sometimes between sites. Destruction layers often preserve rich finds that provide insights into site use. Here we use both macro and micro archaeological methods to study a destruction event from the late nineteenth, late ninth century, at Tel E S dash S A F I. Want to anybody want to try to look this up? So it's at Tel L, -L, -L and then it's small I case. Got, I got it. You I'll, got I'll, it. I'll, yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll see if I can find a pronunciation. Cool. Okay. So get this. A major conflagration at this specific location resulted in the consolidation of parts of the roof construction materials, thus enabling us to differentiate between roof walls and floor materials. We could reconstruct the events which led to the formation of, a, of an approximately 80 centimeter thick layer. Uh, the base of this layer that overlies the floor surface is a thin charred organic material rich ash layer as the clays in this layer were not altered by heat and the ceramics still have preserved residue we conclude that the ash was produced elsewhere and was redistributed to this location however there are ceramics that are associated with burnt roof sediments that do not have preserved residues um so that's interesting. So the roof, the roof was apparently burned extensively. Um, let's see. 
we we identify an unusual bin and associated stone pavement in a corner rich in artifacts, spider lifts, and charred organic material. Um, so, okay, and then it goes on into the introduction. It says that the remains of violent destructions are often pivotal points of archaeological stratigraphic sequences in multi-period complex society sites. Uh, destruction layers in the Levant, at least, are up to a meter or so thick. Hmm. The stratum often contains collapsed wall and roof remains, abundant artifacts, a well-defined floor surface, all buried in a generally non-stratified mass of sediment. Destruction layers are thus thought to represent time capsules that preserve assemblages of material culture characteristic of a particular period and region that enable archaeologists to correlate strata within and between sites, uh, which is interesting and valuable. But, of course, to me, uh, the more important and interesting question is, what was the nature of this destruction event? What happened? Um so like in the Southern Levantine Iron Age, typical examples of such destruction layers are at sites such as Lashish, Ber Beersheba, and Tel Halif, um, and the sites of Timna, Ashkelon, and Ekron. The length of time required for the formation of a destruction layer is not well documented. According to written sources, uh, there were Assyrian and Babylonian campaigns, but uh, in the Iron Age, is that the res is that what caused the destruction? So now, okay, so that raises the question: Was this a natural event, or was it human? Yeah, I was. I was going to say, did did somebody burn the place down, or did you know, right, the, the natural disaster, right? So a study of the formation processes of the 7th century before the Common Era stratum at Ekron suggested that the sequence of events that brought about the end of the site uh, in 604 BC was followed by a period of abandonment before the Babylonian destruction. The interpretation of the destruction and abandonment of Canaanite Hazor represents another such case. Okay. The time span that a destruction horizon represents needs to be better understood. This is a major objective of this study. Here we examine the case of a short-term violent event, the destruction of Tel es safi Gath, yeah, Israel. Tel es -Safi. Tel es -Safi. Tell us, Safi. Okay, and then Goth, I think, is a is a is a you know nickname. Okay, tell us, Safi. Tell us, Safi, Israel, dated to the mid late ninth century before Common Era, and then they they assume that it's probably the result of a a military campaign, which of course could be, but you know that's I think an important question. Um. But if the but see here's the thing they they said that there was an ash layer that looked like the ash came from somewhere else. So, yeah, that's strange. Yeah, I don't. I, how would you explain that according to you know a military? A, a yeah, unless it was or volcanic or something else. Right. Right. So the approximately 80 centimeter thick distinct destruction layer that characterizes the last Philistine settlement at the site yielded a rich assemblage of artifacts, including hundreds of complete ceramic vessels deposited amongst collapsed architectural features. Uh, so let me jump to there. Got some interesting pictures that we won't analyze here, but uh, there's a photograph of the northeast corner of the excavation area showing the sediments with blocks of angular chalk which bury various broken vessels. Uh, note, too, that the 
chalk containing sediment surface slopes to the west. I'm going to have to study this to make sense out of it, but we could look at the... It also seemed to be saying that there were ceramics in the ash that came from somewhere else that were not burned, but that then there were other ceramics associated with the ash from the roof materials that were burned. Okay. Right. That's what it sounded like. Yeah. That's what it, that's what I thought it was saying. Let's so see. A bunch ice. of guys came in with pots that were on fire and they <laughs> threw them and burned the whole place down. I think I've heard a story like that. It's like a guy named Gideon, maybe. Oh, yeah. Burned down an entire army with pots on fire. So it says here, an, a, an isolated human skull and several non-articulated human bones were found at one location under a pile of collapsed building materials just to the west of wall 123007. These bones appear to belong to a person who died during the initial phase of the destruction and was subsequently buried under the collapsed walls. Several additional human skeletons were found on stratum A3 floors under the destruction debris in an adjacent area of the excavation outside the presently examined area. A concentration of burnt animal bones was found about a meter away from the human skull and also adjacent to the brick wall. Uh, all these human and animal bones were clearly lying in the black fine-grained sediment on the floor. Okay, so something happened. And and I'm going to do it. Let's see, I'll do a share screen here, and we'll look at this one uh, of the, the wall here. Uh, I mean, the area, the walls of this corner. Okay, so let me get it lined up. So we've got the photo of the northeast corner of the excavation area showing the sediments with blocks of angular chalk. That's this over here on the left, which bury various broken vessels. Uh, note two, that the chalk containing sediments surface slopes to the west and the interface with the light brown roof sediment in the lower part of the section is almost vertical. Let's see. So the so A, this up here with this black, this is topsoil. So this would have been deposited later. B, which is okay, so this is right here. This is B, and that is uh let's see, A is topsoil, B is roof consolidated and unconsolidated sediment. C which is this over here is part of the remnants of a wall, the Terra Paise wall. D down here is the upper part of the floor, and E down here is the surface part of the floor. So this must have been an upper part of a floor material that maybe collapsed down. And with these blocks of chalk, I guess they would have been the walls. Let's see, if we go up here, there's other pictures you can see of the of the area. And like areas, let's see here, you can see there's, uh, let's see, okay, yeah, look, here's artifacts and things, like one uh, surface exposed at the beginning of the excavation after the topsoil was removed. The stone mortar and burnt sediment slab are indicated by an arrow and arrow head respectively. Okay. So something happened here, uh, and I haven't fully digested this report yet. Well, uh, yeah, first indications that excavation square 89C could be of particular interest. Uh, the results are divided into two sections, the layer-by-layer -layer analysis of the destruction horizon, followed by the analysis of macroscopic and microscopic artifacts that relate to the use of the site at this location. So uh, I'll stop the chair there. So that's, that's one event. 
in the Holocene. Then we've got, uh, you know, the Bronze Age collapse. And there's a lot of studies on that. Uh, let's see. Here's another in- very interesting study. This is uh, from uh, 2023. So it's very recent. And the title of the article, which appeared in Earth Science Reviews, is Abrupt Climate Change in Arid Central Asia During the Holocene, a Review. Uh, And in their abstract, they say abrupt, unlike the long-term, that is, Earth orbital scale climatic trends, abrupt climate changes uh, dominated arid Central Asia during the Holocene, and their origin remains unclear. We present the first comprehensive synthesis of centennial-scale climatic events in this region based on nine rigorously selected Holocene paleoclimate records. The results show that mega-regional abrupt climate events were consistently recorded during the middle to late Holocene. Uh, Strikingly, such mega-regional climate events were rarely indicated in the records before 5.5 thousand years ago. Interestingly, because what they're doing is they're showing up after the neoglaciation climate deterioration. Okay, so they go on to say, uh, this pattern of mega regional wet and dry events, although unevenly distributed in time, is ascribed to the intensification and southward movement of the westerlies since the late Middle Holocene, which favored the establishment of climatic teleconnections across the entire region. By comparing climatic events in the arid Central Asia region with classical records of Holocene abrupt climate events, we particularly found that five centennial-scale wet events were broadly consistent with North Atlantic cooling events and a global synthesis of cold periods supporting a cold-wet climatic configuration in arid Central Asia. Analysis of the mechanisms responsible for these events suggests that these abrupt events were forced mainly by decreased sea surface temperatures in the North Atlantic and negative phases of the North Atlantic Oscillation. Um, So that's interesting that what we see, and this is consistent with other evidence that shows with the global cooling that occurred in the wake along with the the neoglaciation, you now have a deterioration of climate and more extreme and abrupt events occurring. Um, abrupt, and in the introduction, they say abrupt climate changes and extreme synoptic events have always significantly affected the human living environment. Extreme synoptic and climatic events, such as flood and droughts, may last from several days to several years. Uh, so, So, yeah, and then moreover, abrupt climate changes on multi-decadal to centennial timescales may have been an important factor in the rise and fall of past civilizations, including the classical Maya civilization, social changes in ancient Mesopotamia, and the development of cultures and civilizations in China. So consequently, the documentation of past abrupt climate changes on centennial to decadal timescales has become a focus of paleoclimate research. So, uh, so yeah, they're looking at uh, deep sea sediment cores, which revealed a cyclicity in ice rafted debris events. Um, you know, records of glacier advancements and recessions. Uh, that sounded like something of, you were going to get into. That was not the Miyaki events. That's and what I was about rafting. to bring up too. Yeah. Uh, it'd be interesting if some of those indicators in the dendro chronology would line up, like for example, with that archeological site. You, that tell. Right. Telesophy. 
Hello, hello, Safi, yes. Uh-huh. So based in, in, in their conclusions and perspectives, they say that um, based on a comprehensive analysis of nine high-quality Holocene paleoclimate records, a series of mega-regional abrupt centennial-scale climate events in the uh, ACA or, you know, the air, the, the, what was it again? The, uh, the Asia, the arid Central Asia, arid Central Asia is the ACA. They always like to abbreviate things. Um, so the uh, conclusions and perspectives, comprehensive analysis of nine high quality Holocene paleoclimate records, a series of mega regional abrupt climate scale events are statistically identified for the first time. Uh, and these are dating at 6.5 thousand years ago, 4.7, 3.3, 1.8, 1.8, so that's 400 years ago. And then in parentheses, they have corresponding to the Little Ice Age. And they alternated these cold, wet events, then alternated with four dry events, one at around 5.3. The next one at 3.9 thousand years ago, the next one at 2.6, and then finally one at 1.1, and this was corresponding to the uh, medieval warm period. Um, ah, point two, mega regional abrupt climate changes occurred more frequently after the approximate 5.5 thousand years ago than before. Uh, this change is primarily attributed to the intensification and southward shift of the westerly circulation since the late Middle Holocene, possibly linked to an increase in the Northern Hemisphere LTG and the transition to an NAO, North Atlantic Oscillation Negative Phase. So they're talking about then changes in atmospheric current movement and in oceanic. And they're associating it with that. Now, is that the cause or is that something just correlated? I don't know. Um, but it does say, it goes on to say that the wet events uh, are broadly, broadly coherent with North Atlantic cooling events and cold periods in a global synthesis study uh, supporting the cold, wet climatic configuration. Um, so this is interesting. So I don't have the timeline perfect in my head, but it sounds to me like when the climate was warmer, it was more stable. Yes. And then as it started to cool down and it got much colder again, then you start having these That's exactly. crazy outsized events. That's exactly right. Yes. Uh, that's exactly right. Yes. Um. It, it, that's exactly the opposite of what they're claiming today. Oh, yeah. The yeah. weather's going to get worse and all, it's going to be more erratic and crazy. Yeah, we've been through episodes of that where the hurricanes were much more severe. Oh, yeah. It's colder. Yeah. Here's another interesting thing. This is back from 2006. Uh, it was published in, uh, get this back up here. It was published in the Journal of Quaternary Research. It's entitled Tripartite Climate Reversal in Central Europe 5,600 to 5,300 years ago. And this is from the study of variations in water level at Lake Constance, which is in Italy, right? I believe it is. Um, so they did a history of variations in water level of Lake Constance as reconstructed from sediment and pollen analysis of a sediment sequence from the archaeological site of Arbonne Blaché 3. And it shows an abrupt rise in lake level dendrochronologically dated to 5,375 years ago. Uh, this event paralleled by the destruction of the Neolithic village by fire provoked the abandonment of this prehistoric lakeshore location established in the former shallow bay of Arbonne Blaché. 
and was the last of a series of three episodes of Higher Lake Level, the first occurring at 56 to 5,500 uh, years before present. The dendrochronologically dated rise event was synchronous when, with an abrupt increase in atmospheric carbon-14. Hmm. Well, that certainly suggests what? Solar variability, right? Indeed. Increase. So carbon-14 is going to increase when the sun decreases in activity and more cosmic ray bombardment occurs in the upper atmosphere. And then that yeah. creates beryllium-10 and carbon-14. Ah, well, okay, so here's the next sentence. This supports the hypothesis of an abrupt climate change, change forced by varying solar activity. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I guess the no. Miyake event stuff is saying that you can also get increased amounts if the sun has a huge flare. Yeah, because then that could also cause... Yeah. Yeah. The sun itself puts out... Uh, fast, heavy particles that cause yeah. cosmic rays. Uh, lake Constance is a central European lake that borders Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. Switzerland. It's in Switzerland. Right. Not Italy. Fed by the Rhine. Yeah. Okay. Moreover, the three successive episodes of higher lake level between 5,600 and 5,300 years before present at Arbonne Bleche 3 coincided with climatic cooling uh, in various regions of both hemispheres. This period corresponds to the mid-Holocene climate transition or the onset of the neoglaciation and suggests interhemispheric linkages for the climate variations recorded at Arbonne Blaché. Wow. This mid-Holocene climate reversal may have resulted from complex interactions between changes in orbital forcing, ocean circulation, and solar activity. Uh, yeah, over the past 30 years, in the introduction now, European paleoclimate reconstructions based on glacier variations, river and lake level fluctuations, uh, and pollen and plant macrofossils have shown the complexity of the Holocene climate punctuated by successive century-scale cooling events. More recently, records from the Greenland ice sheet and the North Atlantic Ocean have given additional support for a complex Holocene climatic pattern. Moreover, there is growing evidence that Holocene climatic oscillations reflect solar forcing. Here we present paleoenvironmental and archaeological evidence for an abrupt tripartite climate change between 5550 years before present and 5320 years before present. Uh, Lake Constant, Switzerland, linked to a variation in solar activity. Um, oh, interesting. These climatic reversals induced glacier expansion in the Alps and lake level rises of Lake Constance, which led to the abandonment of the Neolithic pile dwellings of Arbon Lache. This may also explain the sudden burial of the Neolithic Alpen Iceman Atzi, recently found in the Tyrolean Alps, a contemporary of the Arbon Lache people. So there, I mean, that's, again, that's, you know, consistent with the fact that the climate becomes more extreme as the climate cools and tends to become more stable in the warmer times. I mean, that's, that's what the data is pointing to. It's not just a conclusion that I'm coming to. It's what the data is suggesting over and over again. So... Again, you know, this is the stuff that that's being neglected in the mainstream media about climate change. 
But all this stuff. Study, if you want to understand climate change, you got to look at the history of climate. But these papers you're reading today are all recent, right? Oh, yeah. These. Interesting. Yeah. You can see sometimes how they. Uh, you know, they're not studying global warming, they're not getting funded for climate change research necessarily. And they'll. You know, people will produce these papers that don't directly have anything to do with modern climate change, but they almost negate the, I mean, they almost defeat the argument. Well, they do. They're not coming from American scientists. They're coming from around the globe. And it's the Americans that want to lead that uh, scare tactic. Well, the money is in, you know, glo anthropogenic global warming. And I mean, now you can see how they're ramping up the narrative. Uh, everything now, everything is yeah. unprecedented and everything is a result of fossil fuels. And ignore the fact that no matter what you're talking about, and we've talked about it a whole lot on this show, it's all happened before. What's happened before is happening now and will continue to happen, regardless of what we do and how many SUVs we drive. It's not going to matter. These things have been happening since since this pl this planet has had a climate, and we can prov we can provide extensive documentation showing that many of these events have far exceeded anything we've experienced in recent centuries or recent historic times. Yet, we're not really talking about that. And people who do talk about this stuff are labeled climate change deniers, which is unbelievable. So, you know, it's just, it's very disconcerting to me when I see all of these now, you know, the, 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 these young people in there, you know, mashing, throwing stuff on works of art, you know, interfering, you know, gluing themselves to the roadways, marching down, blocking tra traffic. Um, all of these things, these tactics that they're doing are, are, are utterly, utterly meaningless. And if you talk to any of these people, do they know any of the stuff we're talking about here? No. Have they read these reports and these studies that we're referring to here? Yeah, every episode that we're doing? No, they, they know nothing of this. What they know is what they've been spoon fed, the propaganda they've been spoon fed since they first started into the public school system. And now into college, you know, and I told you how Julie, in order to graduate, she had to watch, this is back, you know, 10, 12 years ago, but in order to graduate from Emory and get her degree in Middle Eastern studies, she had to watch, she was required to watch Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth twice. Not just once. Once is twice. not enough. <laughs> once is not enough. But yeah, that would book? be... Earth in the balance, like mid nineties. Yeah. Right. So there's like a whole generation now, 25, 28 years yeah. Yeah. Of, of young people that have been fed this, fed this, fed this, fed this again and again. That's and right. They, and they totally believe it. And they totally believe it. Doom porn. And it's time for your brain. Send your kids to the public spoon feeding. Yeah. The public what? The public spoon feeding place. Yeah. Oh, the public spoon, spoon feeding. <laughs> yes. Yeah, okay. Uh So then there this is we won't talk about this tonight. We, we But this is from actually going back to 2000, but from the Journal of Archaeological Science it's called Poseidon's Horses. I might have mentioned this in a previous uh show we did, but it's Poseidon's Horses, Plate Tectonics and Earthquake Storms. In the late Bronze Age, Aegean and Eastern Mediterranean. I like that. Earthquake Poseidon's storms. Horses. What yep, an interesting. I remember that term. Interesting yeah. name. Yeah. Earthquake storms. So it seems like, you know, there is a whole, a whole mass of uh, evidence showing that there is a variety of these different of, of things that are happening. You know, we're seeing that, you know, what is it now that the... Um, you know, the number of, say, impacts, uh, asteroid and comet, bolide impacts in the Holocene is far greater than anybody had 
had previously imagined. You know, look at the work of Bruce Massey and others, you know, uh, Mike Bailey, uh, Victor Klub, uh, William Napier, uh, Duncan Steele. I mean, all of these guys are looking and going, yeah, it looks like there's been a whole lot more impact events. There's also been really big volcanic eruptions, sometimes even appear to be correlated in time. And then we have now we're talking about major atmospheric changes in atmospheric circulation, major changes in oceanic uh, circulation, uh, North Atlantic oscillation, the ENSO events. All of these things are now, you know, we're, we're learning about and realizing all of these are very critically important factors in what's driving the climate of the earth to change. And we started talking and we've only, again, scratched the surface of the emerging evidence for the involvement and, and responsibility of the sun, right? So yet in spite of all of this, in spite of all of this, We've got millions of people now that are now emotionally and psychologically invested in this scenario of, of climate, anthropogenic climate induced doom, even to the point now where I've got, I, I don't have them in front of me, but I've pulled up several articles that have been in the press within the last few months to a year or two, where there's a new subgenre of the psychiatric profession that is now existing just to address climate anxiety right. amongst people shouldn't be laughing that's terrible no you shouldn't this this is this is uh, beautiful <laughs> but uh. i know you can't help it uh but yeah i mean this is a thing and there are now growing number of now this is where something that's definitely not worth laughing at the growing number of suicides amongst young people because of climate dis in climate despair believing now that there's no future and it's going to be due to global warming and they're committing suicide this is a thing now that's happening um which is crazy i mean so these people out there you know if we're coming along and we're presenting well here's evidence that look look four degrees warmer we just showed okay two two think about what we just did this evening we showed two separate references one from british columbia one from uh where was it in the alps can't oh yeah british columbia is canada the, yeah italy. i think it was the italy, italy yeah alps. uh right showing that during the mid during the holocene there have been times when it was four degrees centigrade warmer tree lines were significantly higher than now so why is none of that being talked about? I read an article earlier today. I was going to pull it up on my, I saw it on my phone. I was on a feed and I couldn't find it, but it was basically talking about taking, uh, you know, it, the reference was that are we going to be prepared for climate change? You know, because, and, and really, here's the thing. If we project the probability of the climate changing in future, I'd say it's almost a hundred percent certain that the, yeah, the climate is going to change again. I mean, it's unless of course, and this is a possibility to consider by us increasing the carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere by a few hundred parts per million, we might actually be having a stabilizing effect. And that's something we can return to in another discussion because it's definitely worth considering. Um, but anyways, I mean, here, well, here, I, I would have, I'd have to, I don't know about that. You know, I don't, it just seems like we've looked at all this stuff about how little effect, like increasing the carbon dioxide has once you get over the first yeah. 180 parts per million. Right. And I just, I find it a little hard to believe that we can stave off a coming ice age by warming the atmosphere like 0.1 or 2 degrees. I agree. So, I, I would I mean, agree. I mean, it would I, have to be. It seems more likely that we're just not having that much of an effect at all, at least with CO2. Like we may have it be having effects in other ways. Yeah. But CO2, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm being over optimistic. I don't... <laughs> You're trying to give these people hope. <laughs> I don't. There's, yeah. there's no hope, Randall. The we climate just is going burn to change. More fossil fuels. <laughs> climate is going to change. It's not going to have anything to do with the stuff we do, and we're going to have to adapt to it. And that was the point of this article. 
Okay. Um, that, yeah, we're going to have to adapt. And I agree with that. I mean, but here's my, my concern is, okay, let's say we shut down fossil fuel use and all of the technology and industry that would then also have to, to, to disappear. And the well, materials. Yeah. And what? All the materials. Like yes. so much stuff aside from burning fuel is, is comes from the, you know, the petrol industry industry. Well, yeah. Right? So, so how, what would that do to our adaptability and our ability to respond to a natural climate change? I can't see that it would be anything other than drastically inhibit our ability yeah. to go respond back to living effectively. In yeah, we'd go back to living in heap houses or whatever. Right. Yeah, <laughs> pile, 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 neolithic pile houses. Pile houses. And, and most That's of it's it. are going to be Utsi. Yeah. yeah, frozen in the That's... glacier for five thousand years. Man. <laughs> well, I mean, even a return to little ice age conditions could be really. I mean, that could require some major efforts to adapt to because yeah, there were times when the northern hemisphere saw like a couple of years in a row of agricultural collapses. But look, we we could build greenhouses. We need plastics. We need uh, yeah, you know, we could keep the farming going in a little ice age scenario today we, with fossil fuels. Yeah, plastics. It's and fossil fuels. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah, and possibly now, you know, we'll have to see again. We and a, another discussion we've got to have. I think further. The time has come to discuss plasma energy because there are independent sources besides the. You know the Malcolm Bendel source. There's also, you know, there's there's this. Have you guys seen this this book here? Oh yeah, I did. Robert see that. Temple's book. You know Robert Temple. He did was the serious mystery guy. Yeah, remember that? I'm so I'm I'm reading this. I'm about this far into it, and uh, yeah, I mean it's very interesting stuff. And and the argument he's making is that yeah, that it very well could be the you know, the basis for where technology could evolve to. And uh, if that happens, you know, if you look at the, the, the thunderstorm generator, the, the technology that's now being tested in several laboratories, including a major one, Eastern laboratory and in a German laboratory. Now, what do we see happening there is that, um, yeah, it it looks like several things. One is that okay, when you to to you have to get the requisite temperatures to cause the disassociation of electrons and protons, which creates this ionization in this stream of plasma. That's the first thing. Then the second thing is to stimulate that plasma to self-organize into these into these elegant geometries that now emit energy. In a nutshell, if I'm understanding how it works, right? Well, a couple of things there. One, you need fossil fuels or some way of generating the initial temperatures. So there would still be a function for fossil fuels, just you wouldn't be using it to the extent that we are now. Um, and, you know, I think, did we talk about this in the live stream about how rapidly um, cooling, global cooling can cause the oceans to start sucking out carbon dioxide from the atmosphere yes i think we did that yeah yep. yeah we have talked about it before i don't know if it yeah. was in the last live stream but we have discussed but we that. have talked yeah. about it that. becomes yeah. a carbon sink yeah yes it becomes a massive carbon sink like a big and soda. once once it goes Old, into busy. the into the oceans it's pretty much going to get end up in the sequestered in the rock sequ exactly sequestered in the rock and then that's it. We don't, it's gone out of the atmosphere for a hundred thousand or a million years or more. So, yeah, I mean, the important thing I think we need to do now is to try to, you know, just counter this manufactured narrative. I mean, there's a lot of people that aren't buying it, but you know, the idea is absolutely. We, we need to be very cognizant of our footprint and how we interact with nature all of course we don't want to pollute i mean you know what drives me crazy is when i see people uh throwing trash out the windows of their cars yeah. you know i've noticed something very interesting in in the travels when we get into poorer counties where for example and and i don't mean to be uh, you know bigoted or whatever here but when you get into the poorer counties which usually means less educated you see more trash 
when you come into the counties where, oh, for example, like drive through whatever the counties that that uh, that the the bluegrass region of Kentucky, and you're driving through those fairly upscale counties with the beautiful white fences and the pastoral you don't see any trash i don't but, you know you, you go into the other other counties where it's a lot of trailer parks and things yeah then you see you, and i've seen this over and over again it's not just something that i've seen one time i've i've noticed it a lot yes i would suggest though that it's not because there's less trash being thrown out yeah it's because it's there's, there's more, more money people, people picking pick it, it up, up and cleaning it up yeah there's more resources and people that will dedicate resources to cleaning. Yeah. Well, I generally think that I bet you that if you looked at more educated people, they're going to be less inclined to throw their trash out windows of their car. I, I would just think that maybe I'm wrong. Um, you know, I like, look, here's four of us. And I got, I bet I could say a hundred percent that none of us throw trash out the windows when we're driving. No, we trash don't. We don't out the window. Throw trash I mean, out. No, apple me core, either. I never core, have. Like you said, apple cores. Yeah, anything that an animal yeah. will eat, like apple cores. Yeah, so yeah. banana yeah. peels, orange peel. I know. I just yeah. Some of my orange earliest peel. memories of my dad was Organic. him ranting and raving about trash. Yeah, yeah. You know? Well, yeah. see, yeah. Is... your your dad and my myself, we'd be exactly yeah. in line. with Yeah, that. he's a he's a preservationist. He yes. he loves nature. So, so yeah. yeah, we learned that. I feel the same way about trash. I hate it. Yeah. And now, and and then now, think about the tours we do. I could almost declare that a hundred percent of those people are not going to be throwing trash out the windows. There's a couple of times when the, whoever was riding in the passenger seat of my van left a lot of trash <laughs> in my van. In the van. <laughs> yes, the vans you know, are full of trash by the time we're done with our tours. But there's none, none in the forest none and places gone. we went to visit. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he's seen the cigarette butts getting thrown out. That's you know, oh, God, that's, just that's just so common. Oh man, that's that's it just that's the, the heck out of me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. And you know, a lot of these big fires. You know, what was it? The fires in a lot of these fires that happened. You know, in fact, some studies are showing that up to three quarters of them are caused by humans, directly or indirectly. Campfires, yeah. cigarette butts. Or indirectly because power lines are being knocked over or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, the rest are going to be natural, mostly lightning strikes. Yeah. Yeah. So I, with the, with the cigarette butts, I was a smoker for a long time. And when I was younger, I did throw butts out the window, but I stopped that a long time ago and always. Oh, yeah. Nice yeah. I, I, I smoked for a year when I was 15, 16. I'd quit by the time I was 17, but yeah, I remember, I even have a picture. I'm riding with some of my buddies and I'm sitting there smoking a cigarette Yeah, and we picked up this hitchhiker and one of the guys that I was with threw something out the window and myself and the hitchhiker were just totally getting on his case Yeah, about, you know, Hey, you know, hey, don't, don't, hey man, like, don't hey, throw your shit out the window. Don't yeah. throw <laughs> <laughs> I flick the cigarette butt out be like, don't throw trash. No, I'm like, window. hey man, that's what we got an ashtray for. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> you you may remember the days when cars came equipped with ashtrays. Yes. My, and yes. cigarette lighters. Yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. but it's totally cool to throw your roaches out, right? Right. <laughs> cigarette smokers, you can't throw your cigarette butts down, but if it's a roach. Yeah, you got a roach. That it, was man. not no something problem, that's that's totally nature, that was not something man. I would totally ever do. Bro. I'm like, I would smoke that thing down until it was microscopic <laughs> <laughs> it was not about to throw a roach out the window that was the best part <laughs> so there we go oh <laughs> brad's like i just let the cat out of do the some editing <laughs> oh my god what, that. <laughs> what's gonna happen now if people realize oh randall carlson once smoked some pot <laughs> All credibility gone, Randall. Completely All gone. All credibility gone. Oh, he's just another stoner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's out. All right. Well, we, we better wrap it up. Yeah. That was, that was a fun wrap show. It up. RandallCarlson.com. Yeah. Right? Yep. You guys working That's on some big one. revamps for the website, too? Is that coming up, maybe? Yes. Always yeah. ideas of revamps. Yeah. Yes. That's coming up. And, uh, 
Expand. Yeah. So I guess expand, expand grow, yes. more, more Randall, more, more. more Randall. So Borgo, no, you guys still looks like you're on for Egypt in February. Yes. Yes. Right. Okay. Six weeks. Yes, because we're now we're doing the February tour, and then and then we're doing another one in March right after. Good so Lord. it's going to be two of them back to back. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. They had quite the waiting list. So you are. Yeah, we had to we had to cancel the two. extension of Lebanon, and now yeah. and and we talked about possibly doing an extension in Egypt, but we just decided like there's so many people on the waiting list, we'll just. So the the two tours will be back to back, but they'll basically be the same tour. They'll be the That's same right. Tour. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Well, maybe you can finagle a little bit to get, see some sights. Yeah, I mean, with six. Yeah, weeks, there's really there's always a need. little variability. Yeah. 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 To see, I mean, there's so much to see. Yeah. And you could spend days at one place. You know, when well, I was there for ten days, that was not enough. No. Right. Not, oh yeah. no. What do you? We want are going to gonna go to some places we haven't seen yet. Okay. We've been twice. And we're going to get to go to some new places. So getting to go to those new places twice uh-huh. is going to be great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we'll be going back to other sites we've already seen. But still, I mean, each one is just so, they're they're so enormous. It's like yeah. you always see something new anyway. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, we have just multiple of fast. these sites. We I already know multiple things I want to check again, get better pictures or footage of. Yep. Uh new th- you know things that i noticed later after we got home that i saw in the photos that i didn't see while i was there well i'm like i need to go look at yeah. this yeah there's this one joint in this one block well about right the fifth level <laughs> over to the left in by the that back thing wall, on the north i need wall. to look at that closer yeah. <laughs> <laughs> bring your magnifying glass <laughs> and they know they run right to it yeah well, I'm well that's here. awesome guys take all my time well all right it was fun yep all right we all covered right some stuff yeah um, and I'll see you guys next week, I guess. That's right. All right. Thank Thanks, you, guys. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody.